underlying nature of all of this. <coughs> Whoops. Thanks. Oh. I turned it off. I should be able to turn it on. Right. So you've seen this before. So now we're going to Basically, we're going to use Maxwell's equations, and we're going to calculate this dipole radiation. What is the power per unit solid angle? Basically, it depends on the instantaneous acceleration squared, and it has this sine squared donut pattern. Okay? And we'll get the, the interesting um, cross-sections uh, for the free electron, the, th the Thompson scattering cross-section, for a bound electron, um, the Rayleigh result, and uh, and then for an atom, the complexities that come in from many many different electrons and some interesting special cases through the atomic scattering factor, where basically you can think of I'm looking for a diagram. Um, basically, what we're thinking this is going to be a classical description, maybe it's quotes semi-classical, but in the end you'll get the same result that you get quantum mechanically, and basically think of this as You've got a multi-level system, atomic system, and you're talking about a resonance between two levels. And the, the, uh, s the energy separating the two levels is h bar omega s. So we can, that's what this omega s is. It's a resonance value between two levels, two quantum mechanical levels, if you want to think of it quantum, quantum mechanically. So you'll put h bars on everything, and this will be the photon energies, et cetera. Um, <coughs> and so here's our... Maxwell's equations that we're going to start with, they're written in vacuum, as if in vacuum, where d is equal to epsilon zero e and b is equal to mu zero h. And uh, for those of you who know Hans Hertz, uh, this is his uncle. Um, at any rate, so, uh, so these are the equations governing the propagation of electromagnetic radiation, and including x-rays. And uh, if you manipulate these equations properly, combine these two, and eliminate one of the variables, uh, here we've eliminated, we've used the relationship between B and H here, okay, so that we could eliminate that here and replace it with a dependence on E and come up with a wave equation. Okay, so this, um, it would look more familiar if it was in vacuum, there were no free charges and there were no currents this is in units of, let's say, uh, amperes per square meter. Okay? It's a current density per unit area. And so uh, for transverse waves, um, this would be the wave equation. Um, actually, for, for waves, for electromagnetic waves. Uh, and if there was no current density, you were in vacuum, this would be zero. This would be your, your wave equation in vacuum. And we're going to look at that as a moment, just a, some interesting aspects of that. But, so they're just rewritten here. They're rewritten here because I didn't remember that I had put this in, the constitutive relationship. So I just showed this again. And so in this slide we talked about before, we're going to do, one was chapter two and one was chapter three. One was scattering, using Maxwell's equations to calculate scattering from an individual um, point charge, free bound or in a, atom with some structure to it, and here where there are many atoms, and you do it collectively to understand it and represent it in a simple terms, in terms of some refractive index. So this would be an example where there are many, many particles here doing the scattering, but in a larger sense, they can be added up and represented in terms simply of a refractive index and what happens at an interface. But if you want to think about it more deeply, it's actually scattering going on here amongst all of these particles. It's just that that's the way it, it is in a collective sense. Um, and this we talked about too. So this is the, the, the business here about doing the scattering calculations, starting from Maxwell's equations, wave equations, applying it to an isolated scattering center, and here applying those same things to the, a collective matter. And this is a question that was asked here about how do you determine this delta and beta, or F0 prime and double prime. Uh, 
Uh, and that's where the Crumbs Cronin relation comes in. And also a point to make here, sometimes people call these F1 and F2 rather than F1, F prime and F double prime. You just understand that they're the exact same things or they're closely related. And the subscript zero has a special meaning which will become clearer in the lectures here. But this is in the special case where either the wavelength is bigger than the atom or, or that you're looking in the forward direction. And in those two special cases, everything simplifies. And you know, the, the uh, mathematical terms that lead to all of these angular distributions. But at any rate, everything simplifies. And in that case, I personally put in a subscript zero to separate the two in my mind. Okay? And so that's not universal, but you'll understand it now when you see it. So here we go. This is again. Uh, this one slide is probably the thought process that goes on here is the most asked question in Berkeley in, in uh, the qualifying exams for essentially applied physics and physics and electromagnetics. So basically, you start with one of the Maxwell equations, and you take the curl of that equation, and you use this vector ident identity where for some vector A, in this case it's the electric field, but this vector identity uh, is applied here, and when you do that, go through the, 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 uh, the vector mechanics of it, this is what you're left with, okay? That uh, this gives you these different terms, and you, you collect them uh, in this manner, and you identify uh, this, this appears naturally here, and you just identify it as the speed of light in vacuum. Okay, so C means, just as before, speed of light in vacuum. And so this is a wave equation for a propagating wave written in vacuum, but in a vacuum which has some charges and some current. Some charges which are stationary, some charges which are moving, and um, uh, how do you represent that? So if you have some material, you'll represent it, you'll use these equations they were written for in vacuum in form, but by collecting these terms, you'll see in a moment, you, uh, you represent whatever you want, but some, some solid material would be just fine. So this, oh, and the current density, J, here, at this, is, this is sort of like a fluid level. You could do this as a summation of point particles, just as well here, and in some cases we do it that way in the book. But it's the charge times the number density. So this is uh, atoms per centimeter cubed, or it could be in a plasma, electrons per centimeter cubed and some vector velocity, okay? So it's a vector quantity, and for uh, if it was electrons, you put a minus E here. We start this way because in some of the chapters, the plasma chapters, you have both ions and electrons. You have to sum the contributions, and some will be minus E, some will be plus E with some different mass or something, okay? So this is your, um, for transverse waves, in other words, where the wave is going in some direction and the electric and magnetic fields are in a plane transverse to the propagation direction, that means this is in a certain plane and there's a certain propagation direction. This term goes out because this is a gradient term and it's pointing in that direction. So this goes out. Actually, it, um, uh, it, there is a component J here, three dimensions, and this term and this term, one of the, there's a longitudinal term here that cancels with this, and you're left with a transverse component of the current. So if you're looking at waves that are propagating in that direction, you're only interested in currents in the plane, which are contributing to the wave. And so that came out of the mathematics without having to give it a lot of special thought, but we don't want it to slip, slip past us. So, uh, yeah, so that was one, we're gonna use the wave equation from Maxwell's equation. There's a few other things we wanna develop here. Uh, for instance, the pointing vector and other things. So we have to manipulate these Maxwell's equations a bit. So that was one, one result. Another is, at a certain point, we'd like to use this. This is a longitudinal term, so you can see right away where there's some relationship here. So the transverse component's not playing a role. But uh, this you could call conservation of charge. Okay? It looked like a continuity equation in fluid mechanics. Uh, but it's a relationship that we want to use where, again, the current density, J, is written in this manner, okay? So in a few moments, you'll see it, and this will just be a minus E, and that's a density. So now I'm interested here 
in radiated power. So what, what is it, how could we calculate the radiated power? If we have, let's say we want to do the scattering calculations, we have a wave coming in with some known or unknown electric field. It has an electric field that makes the electrons oscillate. So let's just say we have a single electron all by itself. The wave comes in. The electric field of the, of the wave makes the electron, free bound or part of an atom, oscillate up and down, and it's going to radiate. So there's a relationship between the velocity and the electric field, and we'd like to understand what that is. And, uh, and then, uh, because the electron is now oscillating with a, with a velocity that we know, and a time derivative of the velocity, so we, can, we know there's an acceleration we're going to get radiated power. What is that radiated power? That's the dipole formula that we're going to see. What's this donut pattern is going to come out of this. And, uh, and also, okay, so now we know the dipole pattern. We know what the electric field looks like as a function of angle. It has this donut pattern. What about the power? What is the power radiated? So we need to know what is the power in terms of the electric field, right? We have a, we're interested in a scattering calculation. So we have an incoming field and we produce radiation going out at all different angles, we want to know how much of the radiation was scattered. So if we knew the power of the incoming wave, first of all, what is that power? We, we, we said we know the electric field, what's the power? So this is where the pointing vector comes in. And then for all the scattered power, um, what is the power per unit solid angle? Then integrated, what's the power? Yeah, Jojo. That's a good Going back to the What did I do? Oh. That one. You said that essentially with the J, the, des the current density, and the whole, the, the charge density, you can see that, that is written for the baking, but uh, you can also treat the case of uh, matter. Yes. So and we're going to do it. Yes, yes. Uh, I was uh, wondering just, but the current density there and the charge density there are just, uh, I mean, are not those induced by the field. You mean there are? I mean the ampere uh, currents or, um, or uh, the, the polarization. But you can uh, represent them this way. Yeah. Yeah. And it, Basically, yes, we just. But the point is that. Uh, you mean the effects of on each other? Is that what you're worried about? Yes, exactly. Yeah, but but you can do it all self consistently, so you don't you're not missing anything. Let, let's just, I think if we go through, you'll see it comes out quite quite parallel. Mm -hmm. But this way, this was a plasma physicist doing the calculations, and there, uh, that's that's where I started my life. So. Um, that's the path I was on. OK, so here you take the Maxwell's equations that we were looking at before, and uh, you form some relationship which is going to tell you about the flow of power, okay? which is represented by the pointings uh, vector. Uh, this thing, this E cross H, which we'll represent as a vector S, as a directionality to it, is the pointing vector. And this relationship is called pointing's theorem. But the way you get there is you start with Maxwell's equations, uh, the equations we had before. I guess I should back up and say what they were. Ah, these two equations, OK? You take the 2.1 and 2.2. You take those here, and you multiply one with an h dot and one with an e dot. So this thing is this, so it's h dot this. And uh, you get these various terms when you multiply this, uh, what was on the other side of the equation here. So here's the J, the J term, the, the B, the D, and the J term. And you use these relationships, again, assuming that you were in vacuum. Another vector identity is used. And if you apply these things here, you get uh, where it was, um, you know, if you apply these things, you'll get the E and the H come in this way. A divergence of E cross H equals these things. And you recognize this, not instantaneously uh, known to you, but you recognize these as the rate of change of energy in the magnetic field, be because of the magnetic field, and the rate of change due to the electric field. 
and there's some other term here which you represent, which you, you recognize uh, on simpler terms as a flow of energy in or out of a system. So you can imagine there's some volume in space and there are some charges in it. And this is telling you that if you look at the electric and magnetic fields in there, there is an energy in the magnetic fields, there's an energy in the electric fields, and there's a flow of power either in or out, depending on how these are aligned. And you combine those things, and this is telling you that the divergence of the radiated power, you label this as X, is related to this change in energy inside the system. So whether there's energy flowing out of the system or in is represented by some vector E cross H, which pointing was the one to recognize, and it's called, this relationship is called pointing's theorem. And you can integrate the whole thing uh, using Gauss's divergence theorem, and if you do, you'll, you'll get this thing. And this, this uh, integral version of it helps you to recognize that this is the change of energy density inside some, some region. Uh, and this is the energy uh, in, absorbed, and this, or, or, or out, or dissipated. So anyway, so this brings up, so this just gives us a handle on recognizing what is the power per unit area in an electromagnetic wave. And it's this E cross H. So that's the main thing you get out of this Pointing's theorem for us. And we're going to use it because we want to know if we put radiation onto an isolated charge and it accelerates and radiates, what was the incident power per unit area? And now we know it's E cross H. And for the radiated field, again, we, have, we know it's E cross H. So, so those were some useful theorems that we, the three useful th uh, things that we needed to know, the wave equation, the conservation of charge, and the energy per unit area, the pointing vector. And another thing we'd like to know is we don't always want to deal with E cross H, right? If we know it's a plane wave, we know there's a special relationship between E and H, and what is that? So the pointing vector, which we would have of E cross H, we can simplify, actually. And so this is where I don't want to go through the mathematics, but, uh, or I don't think we should do it. You know, it's impossible to keep up with it. It's impossible to me to keep up with it as it goes by. But if you're interested, all these details are spelled out line by line in the textbook. But what you find is that from Maxwell's equations, you can find that the magnetic field is real in, a, in a plane wave is related to the electric field by a simple K cross. So K, um, I didn't tell you what K was. Um, so you have the, um, the dispersion relationship that F lambda equals C, where F is the frequency, lambda is the wavelength, C is the speed of light in vacuum. And um, lambda, so 2 pi over lambda is a wave number, K, 2 pi over lambda. And the, it, but if, if it's a wave, it's going in a certain direction with a certain wavelength, so it has a K, 2 pi over lambda, but it's pointing in a certain direction, so it's a vector wave number. And that's what this, that's what the K is here. Uh, it's what this is, meaning it's a unit vector. That's what the subscript is. So for instance, I'm representing the electric fields in a uh, Fourier distribution as having Fourier components in K and omega space, frequency and wave number space, for waves that are propagating of this form, e to the minus i, omega t minus k dot r. Okay? So this is the vector k. It's telling you what direction you're going with. And if you use such a representation, you'll find that the magnetic field and the electric field are related in this way. And then if you say that s, we knew from the previous relationship, is e cross h, here's the h, and you put these things in, this is what you get now for what is the flow of power. Power per unit area is this. Okay? And if you averaged it, if you said that these were sinusoidal fields, and you averaged over, a, over a, a period, I indicate the average meaning average over a cycle, uh, a half comes in. So um, what do we want to do? Now, what are the radiated fields due to a certain current? So here's the stage. Again, I've got this charge that's going to oscillate. So there's going to be a current density. It has an acceleration, has a velocity. There's going to be a J dot which is the accelerate, and it's going to radiate. And we'd like to find out how much power does it radiate. 
Okay, this is how we're going to get the cross section. So we're going to go back to Maxwell's equations, and we want to calculate E. Uh, we need J. J is NQV, and we want to use that to solve for E. And this is where you have to choose your mathematical approach. And I have I've made my choice, and it's in the text, and it flows. And I don't expect everyone to follow every step of here. I just want you to get the thought process of how we're going to do this. But basically, and a relatively easy way to do this is to switch from real space to k omega space by introducing a waveform of this type, that the electric field is e to the k omega, e sub k omega, some amplitude, this exponential wave. But there are many k's in omega possible. You don't always know what they are to start with. You may know the frequencies, but you don't know the k's or something. Um, are you in the a dielectric material or not. But anyway, if you do this representation, Fourier representation in space and time, okay, omega space, where this is the inverse, so this is just your normal Fourier transforms, but in four dimensions. And now you'll say that in this representation, the operator, partial with respect to time, becomes to minus i omega. What does that mean? Well, if you have a wave of this nature and you take a time derivative of this, this is an amplitude. It doesn't depend on time to first order. Okay? And it, the time dependence is here. This is the spatial dependence. So if you take a derivative with respect to time, what it does is it just brings down a minus i. Okay? And so the time derivative acting on this would be the same as algebraically multiplying by minus i omega on the same quantity. Okay? And a gradient, a divergence, you could see it in one dimensional. If, for instance, if you wrote this as kz times z, it was one dimensional, then a derivative with respect, uh, this would be a derivative with respect to z, and you'd get a, a minus and a minus, you'd get a plus ik. So in, you can see in three dimensions then that an operator acting on this field would go through here and it would just bring down an ik. Whoops, hit the wrong button. Okay, so this is why this is, it turns out to be a simplification because where you have some messy vector operators before, uh, you're substituting them now with algebraic operators. Okay? And so this relationship, the wave equation, if you make these substitutions, if you replace this E with this thing and this J with the equivalent for a decomposition, then every term will have these integrals over k omega. This, you'll have it here, and every other one will, and you have these operators. So, uh, for instance, this, this operator right here on the electric field, if you put this in, th these don't depend on the time, only this does, and the integrals uh, are also not, uh, the integrands are not dependent on time, so this brings down a minus i omega squared. And this relationship here winds up looking like this. The integrals that were there are there on every single term, so you can just eliminate them. So this wave equation in RT space, by making these substitutions, becomes this wave equation. And it's, now it's algebraic. Here it was a more complicated vector differentials now it's just an algebraic relationship. And we're, we're going to, we still have the current to calculate what is J. So J is minus E, electron density, which for a, a point particle might be represented by a delta function, and a velocity that depended on the electric field. We're just going to use F equals MA. We're going to write the Lorentz force, you know, uh, mass times acceleration equals the Lorentz force, and the, the, the minus IE will come in. And from that, we're going to get the velocities that we need. But So we'll know how to get j here. But once we get it, how do we get ek of omega? Well, um, algebraically, we take and we divide this on both sides. And then we'll have this ek of omega depends on this thing divided by this. This obviously has some problems when omega is equal to kc. Something, go, something has to be done there. But that's what the next slide is about. We're going to take the same equation and divide by both sides and recognize these as poles in the complex plane.
say that omega is, you know, there's a little bit of absorption, so it's going to, well, even if there weren't, we could do it, but uh, we're going to wind up uh, doing an integration in the complex plane. So here's the same relationship that we had before. Ah, and one point to just notice, suppose you're in vacuum and there was no current, just to recognize some, 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 some places along the way that we recognize. If there was no current here, this would be zero, and this expression would say that this product is equal to zero. Well, if we have a plane wave propagating, this is not zero. We, we're not interested in that case. We want to know when there's a finite wave propagating. If this is zero in vacuum, there's no current, let's say, and this is finite, then this must be zero. The operator must be zero. So if the operator is zero, that leads us to, omega, um, if that's true, omega is equal to kc. Has to be the solution. There are two solutions, because it's squared. So uh, this, by the way, this is 2 pi. You know, there, this is 2 pi over lambda, 2 pi f. So this is equivalent to this, with a plus or minus sign. Why are there two? There's a, uh, this is a s second order equation, so we expect two solutions. We get two solutions. One is, let's say, uh, right propagating, and one is left propagating, or one is propagating out, and one is propagating in. So this is um, uh, things that you would expect from electromagnetic theory in vacuum. If it's not in vacuum, this term here will show up, either through scattering or refractive index. That's what you're going to see uh, a little bit more in this lecture. But OK, we're in the situation. This would be called, um, if, you, if this was equal to 0, you'd call it the homogeneous equation, right? The homo homogeneous partial differential equation you're going to solve. We're interested in, in the inhomogeneous. We want a source there. We want to know what, does that, what fields does that source drive. So we don't want the 0 case. We want this case. And this is where I said we would solve for ek omega. We'd have all of this divided by this term which we can factor into an omega plus or minus kc, okay? And we can solve this. This was the Fourier amplitude and the Fourier transform. So put it back into the transform that we had before, and this is what, now you can solve for the electric field. So it sounds a little bit difficult, difficult but it's actually not when you get into it. And so we now, we have to solve this integral. And this is where we would recognize this. First, we'd factor it, and we'd see two, two terms, uh, one of which could uh, uh, is, it looks like it's going to explode, the integral, right? But we'll, we'll integrate that uh, uh, in, um, uh, in a complex space, OK? We'll use a Cauchy integral theorem to solve that. So we get to use some of our undergraduate learning. And this representation, just the way it is, is a Green's function representation. So those of you who have, have studied Green's functions in math but never used it, here's a place where you can use it. Okay? So this says that if I knew the current density that was driven for any model that we're going to look at, and we'll look at a couple of models, we can put it in here and then do the integration. We just have to figure out how to integrate these factors. And that's where, I'm um, sorry. So I'm going to say, OK, this point, we're going to look at a free electron. It's so small compared to the wavelength that we'll represent it as a point particle. Uh, and that's what's shown here. The current density is normally written in this way, but the density function is now a delta function. Okay? In this case, it's a fine approximation, where the usual delta function properties are shown here. Okay? If x, it's a product, it, this means that this is a product of three different delta functions. Each one of them has this property that if x is equal to 0, it's infinite. And if x has any other value, it's 0. Okay? And, but it's a product of three of them. That's what the, this vector r. This is, this is an identification. It's not an, an, an equal sign. Uh, but it has the property that when you integrate over the delta function in each of the three dimensions, this is a normalization condition. So if you, if you do that, then this density function here uh, is just is this thing, OK? And you put this in, and now you can solve for jk omega. And what you'll recognize, it makes the integration very easy. You have a delta function. So the dr integration is very easy with the delta function. And you just have the e to the i omega t. 
velocity as a function of time, and this you recognize as v of omega. So this is, your t this is what I meant, you can't follow this. It's impossible to follow all of these steps here. But basically, you can write now that the, the, the current density term that you need to solve the electric fields can be written in this way. And it's transverse, meaning that it's transverse to the propagation direction. So here's the integration that we have to do. We want to get the electric field in terms of some current density. And then we're going to work out what's the current density for the free electron, the bound electron, and the others. You have to do the integration. And we wind up doing this using the Cauchy integral theorem. Okay? We recognize that this has a zero. It's a pole. We say that uh, omega equals kc uh, gives us two poles on the axis. If you know Cauchy principal value theorem, you can just integrate it that way. But if you didn't get that in your undergraduate education, you just say, well, you know, waves propagate. There's always some loss. There's some, some tiny little scattering or some, something moves the poles slightly off the axis, just infinitesimally. It doesn't matter how much. It, it's not essential because you can do the integration without that. But if you do that, it makes it very simple. One pole goes one way, one pole goes the other. This is real and imaginary parts of k in this integration. If you do this, if you just follow through the steps, you'll have a form of the electric field. The radiated electric field depends on the transverse component of the current. Okay? So if the vector is not just in one direction, if it's in several directions, then you're going to radiate electric fields in several di directions. But if you have an, uh, an electron just going up and down with some, uh, driven by some incident wave, x-rays, uh, this is what you're going to get. And uh, so what are some of the things, you know, this was something that you may have seen as an, in an undergraduate or early graduate school physics class, was that an accelerated charge radiates electric fields, and this is the formula, and uh, depends on the transverse component of electric field. The transverse component is what leads to that sign, that sign of the angle in the donut pattern. It gets squared because it depend, intensity depends on electric field squared. But this, is, this subscript T is uh, what introduces that. And it's in retarded time. So if the electron is going up and down and it's radiating, what you see in the electric field, the phase of the electric field, depends on how far away you are. How many cycles are you away? There's a little bit of a retarded. Uh, there is a retarded time in there. So this has all of those things. And the electric field depends on 1 over r. And when you square it to get the intensity, it's 1 over r squared. So OK, so this is what, what we just found, is that the electric field depends on the instantaneous um, acceleration. And we found earlier that, that the power density, the pointing vector, depends on the modulus of electric field. And so if we wanted, we could figure out, OK, if we have an oscillating charge by this acceleration, what's the, radiated, uh, what's the power per unit area that's coming from that? It's radiating. The radiating charge is radiating electric fields. The power per unit area depends on that squared. So this is what you would get then for the pointing vector for an oscillating electron. So now we just have to look at some examples um, of that. And, uh, the transverse component of electric field can be written in this way in terms of this particular version of theta. And this is, your, this is a vector representation. This is what leads to this donut pattern. Okay? It's a wave propagating in this direction with transverse components in these two planes. And the acceleration is at some angle. So okay, um, perhaps that's enough to be said. Anyway, if you follow this through, this is the pointing vector. Uh, which is power per unit area in a given direction, depends on theta. Maybe you'd like to know what is the power per unit solid angle. And so you can, you can introduce some relationships between power per unit solid angle and, and the area, at the uh, element of area in any solid angle. And you can convert this to a power per unit area. So this, this is a, uh, a vector with a magnitude which is watts per centimeter squared, power per unit area. And here it is converted for different angles into power per unit area. So for instance, if the electron is oscillating up and down, 
there is no radiated power in that direction, right? It's something that we knew, but uh, this is where it comes from. The power per unit solid angle, when the angle gets to be 90 degrees, there's zero power. Okay, okay so those are some expressions that we use. Um, the total radiated power now uh, is of interest to us. This is the power per unit solid angle. What if we want to know, okay, that's telling us how the power is distributed in this donut shape. What if we want to know what's the total power radiated? We're going to need that for the cross sections. Um, we, in order to do that, we need to integrate at a large distance, integrate over the area, or equivalently over the solid angle. And so to get the power, we need this, we need this S, which was on the previous slide, which is here, and we integrate, uh, here we're integrating over solid angle. And if we do that, the R squareds cancel out because this, this is now per unit solid angle. And if we just go through the integral, we wind up with an easy integration at the total power winds up, uh, there's a sine squared here and the solid angle had a sine in it. The phi integration is just two pi. And so uh, we do this and this, th this part gives us a four third. And the total power then radiated uh, by an oscillating charge is now, depends on the oscillation amplitude squared, and it has this 8 pi over 3, which we always see coming up in these cross sections. Okay? Uh, and again, if you average over a cycle, you get this one half factor. So this, now we've got a lot of elements of information that we want to use uh, to do the scattering calculations. Okay, so again, I just remind you, this is how we, said, we said we were going to define a scattering cross-section. It was the total power sent in all directions divided by the power per unit area incident. So this again had units of, let's say, watts. This was watts per centimeter squared. The amplitude here, by the way, I would call intensity. Intensity of the laser intensity in watts per centimeter squared. That's what this is, okay? So this is a vector, but if you take the magnitude, it's the intensity. So it's the total power scattered by the intensity. So watts, and this is watts per centimeter squared, so you get a cross-section, a cross-sectional cross area. And uh, now we'll see where do these formulas come from. So here's our definition of power. Here's our definition of, of the pointing vector for an electric field. I put a little subscript here, I and I meaning the incident wave. Okay, just so I could track all of these things. Now I'd like to calculate J. J equals, you know, minus E uh, NV. What is V? What is, the, what is the velocity or the acceleration, which is going to come up in the formulas, what is the acceleration of an electron if there's a plane wave with an incident electric field I? Okay, so we're just Newton's second uh, equation of motion, F equals MA. So it's mass times acceleration equals the Lorentz force. Um, you can show that is, uh, for, uh, let's say, the electron is oscillating up and down at some velocity v. Okay? If v is small compared to c, this term is small compared to this term. This term only comes in when, the velo when this velocity is nearly equal to c. And there's a footnote in the book there at the right place to show you that step. But basically, you can then say that mass times acceleration equals minus EE. And we, in order to do this calculation, we needed to know what was the acceleration of the charge. So now you see we're getting there. We had this formula that the, the power, average power, had this half factor, had this 8 pi over 3. And then here is the acceleration squared, the modulation of acceleration squared. So this expression here is now up here. Okay? And other than, so this is what we were calculating. This is the formula that we had for cross section and for a free electron. Um, uh, this is what we get. That free electron, I said free electron, maybe I didn't emphasize it enough. But this was for a free electron, okay? So we put that all in, all of these terms come in, and there's just a lot of cancellations, but there is what's called a defined classical electron radius, which involves the total electron energy, mc squared. m is the mass of the electron, it's the rest mass, there's no subscript zero, I've been convinced that I should 
not do that. But this is the rest mass, and it's a potential. So you're equi equi You're making equivalent a rest mass, and the charge, uh, the energy of of the uh, of the electron, the electrostatic energy, and put them together, and you get a classical electron radius, and it has a certain numerical value, which is shown down here. Okay, and so if you combine a lot, if you recognize that this is in a lot of these things, and you simplify the expression to say that for a single free electron, which is what we were calculating, this is the cross section. This electron radius squared, the small quantity times the quantity 8 pi over 3, and this is called Thomson scattering. Thomson scattering is a free electron oscillating. And although we went through a lot of process to get to it, it's now very easy for us to get other, other cross sections, the bound electron, the atom, etc. And that's where we want to get to today. And again, notice it doesn't depend on the wavelength. So the free electron, it has no resonances associated with it. So it doesn't depend on the photon energy in any way, and therefore it doesn't depend on the wavelength. So you see that this, excuse me, this is, this is wavelength free. So it's the same, the electron, a free electron has the same cross section for microwaves, lasers, light, visible light, and for x-rays. So that's interesting. Uh, you know, Thomson scattering is a very important um, plasma diagnostic tool, and we use it a lot, and this is the cross section for a single electron, so you can do some calculations. You have a laser beam coming into your plasma. It has an electron density of, say, maybe 10 to the 14th or 10 to the 20th electrons per cubic centimeter, and the light is being scattered out. You can use this to find out what kind of signal are you going to see with your laser scattering. In the very earliest measurements of the, uh, of the tokamak plasma uh, in Moscow at, uh, at the Kurchatov Institute, um, oh yeah, this is a kind of interesting little story. The Russian the Soviets at the time were claiming that they had this plasma toroid that got to a very high density and temperature, much higher than any other facility in the world at the time. This would have been in the late 60s, as I remember. And uh, not everyone was believing it because it was awfully good. You know? And so, for instance, the Princeton people who had big other kinds of plasma uh, devices, accelerators uh, and other things, didn't quite believe this. So a deal was made between the head of the Kurchatov and the head of the, of the Cullum Laboratory in England to measure the temperature uh, and density of the plasma using laser scattering, ruby laser scattering. It was a new tool at the time. The ruby laser had only been unveiled a few years before that. And so uh, a deal was made. They would send two people to Cullum, uh, from Cullum to the Kurchatov to measure using Thomson scattering the temperature and density of the plasma. And the, uh, the UK sent um, Nick, somebody help me. Up. I don't know if he had just gotten his PhD or he was just about to get his PhD, but um, I'm sorry, I can't get his name. Nick, somebody, went, went to Cullum, uh, went to uh, the Kurchatov and confirmed what they were already saying to the world based on other measurements, that indeed this plasma had, a high, had this high density and by the spread of the scattering, because the, the particles are moving, you know, what we were talking about, one particle is just here, and so it radiates at the same frequency and wavelength as the incoming radiation. But in the plasma, those independent electrons are moving towards you, away from you, so there's a little Doppler shift. And so rather than see radiation scattered at just this very narrow w laser wavelength of the ruby laser, it had a spread to it, and from that you could get the temperature. So they got the density and the temperature, and uh, that was it. It was confirmed. Literally, Princeton started to tear down their big uh, plasma device at uh, Princeton University just on the basis of this report. You know, it, it was in the newspapers all over the world before it was published. It was such a hot topic. So uh, maybe in a moment I'll remember Nick's last name. Um, okay, so, so Thomson scattering and this cross-section in itself are very interesting. Uh, what about if you had a bound electron? So you say, okay, well, we need to do a quantum mechanical calculation here. But in fact, you can get away with a great deal here using just a semi-classical model. 
And so imagine that this is your equation of motion. This is the F equals MA we had before. This is the mass times acceleration. These are the Lorentz terms. Again, this is not so important. Here's a potential energy term and a damping term of some kind. So classically, this would be absorption. But there are non-absorptive ways to explain this. And in the quantum mechanical model, where the oscillating between two states at some frequency, omega s, uh, this would be a lifetime effect. Okay? So a non-absorptive uh, effect. And so this is the equation of motion, which we can use just fine. And when we get done with all the results, we'll compare it to the quantum mechanical model. And you'll see that it's, um, you can make a one-to-one -one correspondence there. So this is, again, what we need to do is we, we need to find out what is the acceleration so we can, uh, uh, depending on some incident field, what is the acceleration uh, that results? And from that, how do we calculate power and everything else? So we've already got the formulas. Now when we calculate the, the acceleration from the inc incident field, it depends on um, this potential energy term, right? The oscillation now isn't uh, the the acceleration result that we get is not going to be independent of frequency because there's this potential term in there, okay, uh, in the bound state. So again, we assume a wave that has this form to it, and we solve this equation with this. When you make this substitution here, any derivative with respect to time just brings down a minus i omega. So this one doesn't have anything. This will bring down a minus i omega. And this one will bring a minus i omega squared. So now you, you can see where there's going to be an omega squared and omega s squared. And it's a minus i squared. So you're going to get a negative term. And when you solve this equation for x, it's just algebra now. This is what you get, that the amplitude of oscillation depends on the, the field. And if you take the derivative twice with respect to time to get acceleration, it's a Derivative of this twice with respect to time gets you an omega squared again. So this is now the acceleration you can expect from an electron oscillating between two states. Okay? And so when you just substitute this into the expressions that we had before, now the cross section you get looks like this. It has that same um, result from Thompson in the front for the free electron, but it has this multiplying term. If your frequencies are... Um, well above this, which isn't always the case, but if they are, you see that you have this omega fourth and you have this thing squared. So if your frequency gets, if the imposed frequency of the electromagnetic wave, the x-ray, is close to an atomic resonance, what does that mean? You're close to a resonance between n equals 1 and n equals 2, for example, where the electrons would naturally, uh, could uh, naturally oscillate uh, you, you can drive this oscillation into v enormously large amplitude. I'll show you a, a picture in a second. But anyway, so that's what's different now with the, with the bound electron uh, that you can have these effects. So here it's repeated up here. And this is a graph with a, a broken axis here. When you normalize the frequency, when you look at the scattering cross-section as you vary this frequency or photon energy, but just put H bars on here and it'll look a little better. Uh, when you look at a frequency scan of that here, this is what it looks like. Okay? So at the resonance, there's this giant pulse. On the low side, on the low side, if you're below the resonance, it has this fourth power dependence. So how can you see that? Um, when you're on the low side of the resonance, this term, it's squared, is very much smaller than this term. So you have an omega to the fourth, and this becomes an omega to the fourth. So it looks like this. Okay? So for a single bound electron oscillating between two states, this is what the cross section looks like. Okay? It has a peak here, and then it has this slow tail. And uh, so just below the resonance, I was saying that this is going to be an omega to the fourth over omega s squared. If you flip it in wavelengths, it looks like this. This is what's called Rayleigh scattering. So this is, this is just general scattering from a bound electron. But in the approximation that you're below the resonance, you get what's called Rayleigh scattering. So here's an example of this is the blue sky. And there, the resonance, so this is visible light, not x-rays. 
But in that case, the resonances are the bound electrons in the oxygen and the nitrogen in the atmosphere. So all of those molecules are up there. And they all have resonances in the ultraviolet, a little bit higher photon energy than the visible light. And so the visible light, so they're, they're in this case. The resonances are in the ultraviolet. The visible light from the sun is below that. And uh, the scattering cross-section, this is a fixed number. This is showing that the shorter wavelengths scatter more by the fourth power. So um, this, this is what leads us to uh, what's called Rayleigh scattering. But why is the sky blue? So this is, this is the, uh, forget this for, for a moment. Here's you on Earth looking up into the sky. Okay, At night, you would see nothing. Right, except little bright dots out here, which are stars or other planets reflecting light. They're up here. But during the daylight, uh, the light from the sun is quite strong. It's giving off, let's say, equal amounts of red, blue, and green. And they're coming this way into the atmosphere. So some of it comes right to you. You don't look at the bright sun, right? But you look up anywhere else in the atmosphere, and light is coming to you, and it appears blue. And the reason it does is because of this formula that the Rayleigh bound electrons, uh, if the wavelength, it depends on one over wavelength to the fourth. These all wavelengths, this is a longer, uh, it depends on the wavelength to the fourth, one over the wavelength to the fourth power. And so the blue has the shortest wavelength, and it may be twice half the wavelength of the red, approximately. And so this is a, a factor of like a half to the fourth power. So the blue light is scattered throughout the atmosphere, much more than the red light. Okay? So when you look up, you're actually seeing light of all the different colors. But the blue light is scattered much more intensely. And you say, ah, I see a blue sky. Okay? The rest of it's there. Uh, there's some other subtleties if someone asks the question. Oh, by the way, here's the resonances. Uh, the other thing then is as the sun sets, the, now the light goes through a longer path, a lot of scattering. And everywhere along the path, the blue light is being scattered and the green more than the, the, uh, the blue and the, uh, the red, the blue and the green are being scattered more. And so what's left is the red coming through. And this, the closer this is to the horizon, the longer the path, and in particular, the longer path along the dense part of, of the atmosphere here. And so what's left is red. Okay? This is enhanced by dirty air with small particles. So you can get the Rayleigh result as he originally did by assuming that uh, it was uh, scattering from small particles because they had seen at the time that there were volcanoes that produced gigantically beautiful uh, red sunsets around uh, large areas because these very fine particles from the volcanoes were getting everywhere. And that led them into a more mechanical analysis. But later, they used electromagnetics. And Rayleigh himself realized that this could be done just on this, the basis that you've seen here before. So at any rate, that's why you, 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 uh, you see red at sunset. And by the way, suppose you're at sunset and there's a cloud up here. What color will the cloud look? Looks red, yeah. And why does it look red? Because everything else is scattered. Because what it sees is red. Just like what you saw was red, the cloud sees red. It's the only thing it can reflect. So on a really good sunset, where this is really down at the actual bottom, the light is coming up and it's bouncing off clouds. And you can tell high clouds from low clouds just by which ones are red and which ones aren't. They have to be low enough to have this effect to be read. So OK. So that's in interesting stuff. Now, what about if we have an atom? Of course, this is of interest to us here, where you have a lot of electrons. This is an atom, by the way. This is my version of an atom. Okay, It has a bunch of electrons spread around there. Okay, And now, when we do the current density, we again use delta functions, but we've got z electrons. The nucleus is z, so we have z electrons. And they're spread around in this atom. So this is an instantaneous picture. We couldn't predict it because quantum mechanics wouldn't allow that. But here's a bunch of point electrons at some particular uh, instant. And we're off here as an observer. And if you say, OK, here's my incident wave with the k vector. And there's an electric field, let's say, pointing up this way and magnetic field out. 
and, and this wave comes in, imagine that this transverse to this is some planes. So these two electrons, drawn very carefully here, they see the same incident phase, and they oscillate in phase with each other, just those two, okay? So they oscillate in phase, but we're over here, we're the observer over here, and the distance from this one to my eye and this one to my eye is different. So they're not in phase anymore. They're not in phase, they were in phase with the incident radiation, but they're not in phase when they reach the observer. And this is what leads to angular effects because there's a phase effect here. So when the wavelength is comparable to the atom or even smaller, each of the electrons, uh, uh, the phases of the scatterings aren't the same. If the wavelength is very large, enormous compared to this atom, so with soft x-rays or EUV, every, ad every electron is radiating in phase, and the phase differences over a long distance are the same, and every one of these electrons will radiate in phase in all directions. You'll actually get more scattering. You'll get an n-squared effect because it's, uh, they're adding constructively everywhere. But when they're... Um, when the path lengths are, 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 are um, close enough to the wavelength, you get important phase effects. And that makes the mathematics all but impossible. So we're interested, we'll wind up being interested in some special cases where these phase effects aren't so important. But to know when that is, we need to mathematically go through and find out what that is. So this is just some geometry which allows us to figure out what that is. And so we introduce a vector, delta R, S, the same as the S for the particles, for the resonant frequencies, and different angles. And now impossible to do this for you, for, or for you to absorb this, but basically you write the same equation for each of the particles separately and get each of them's acceleration. But now you have to be careful with the electric field to put in the phase effect peculiar to that particular electron. So taking the origin of the atom and then this distance and these angles, you introduce a phase effect for radiation coming in at a certain angle and reaching the observer. And if you follow this through, this is what you'll get for the electric field. Okay, where now you have to sum over all of the electrons in the atom, and each of them has may have some different um, resonance is associated with it. In fact, quantum mechanically, you would say, okay, I have an electron. It's a valence electron, let's just say, to make life a little, well, any electron. There are many transitions it could make to unoccupied states. Every one of them is a potential uh, oscillating frequency, h bar omega s or photon energy, and you have to figure out what's the probability of all of those things. You'd have to know that in order to get an accurate accurate calculation here. So this uh, sort of classical approach to it is leaving out some important details. Uh, it's also leaving out very importantly what would be the line width. But uh, but at any rate, you, you get the idea with this model. So actually in the quantum mechanical model you'll see in a moment, you have a double summation over all from each of the electrons over every possible initial state and final state. That would be the proper thing. But uh, But this is what each one of those things would look like. And if, for instance, you can look this up in Jackson. You'll find these same things. Uh, and I was quite pleased when I was done. I wanted to check it with somebody. Yeah, so there it was. OK, so, uh, oh yeah. Let me just go back. Let's, we had a result before for the bound electron. We didn't have the sum sign, but we had this formation to it. But there's some extra elements here. Those extra elements are what we call the atomic scattering factor. If you took this result and compared it to the result for a single electron uh, that was oscillating with a single frequency, what would be the increase in electric field, not intensity, but electric field, as a function of angle at all angles? So how would, how, what, this is multiplying, if you wrote this as multiplying the, the original stuff for a single electron, this is what you'd get that the electric field at some distant position depends on all of the things it depended on before, okay? but it has this extra factor in there. This is compared to a single free electron. Sorry, I didn't say that right before. Comparing the scattered electric field for an atom with many electrons to the electric field scattered by a single free electron, you get this multiplier, which we were 
we've become comfortable with, which is the frequency part of it, there's also a phase effect in here because the particles might have been distributed. So you need to evaluate how important is this, is this term here. And this whole factor is called the complex atomic scattering factor. So if you look up in some of the, um, the quite famous X-ray diffraction books, something, you'll find these things. And uh, what you need to do is analyze this. When is this important and when is it not? When it's important, you're going to get an angular distribution in the scattering factors. And uh, that's what's shown here. We want to know when is this an important term and when is it not. If we can neglect it, it makes life easier. So here's a magnitude analysis of this term. Let's just take what is the magnitude of delta K and delta RS. And uh, if we do that, Delta K had to do with the angle and the magnitude of the incident wavelength and the outgoing scattered wavelength. And, and that's what's shown. So, so we have these two terms. And delta R is sort of the magnitude. What's the radius of this particular electron from, from the middle of the atom, the center of the atom? So we can represent that by the Bohr radius. A0. This delta K depends on the, on the incident wavelength, wave number, 2 pi over lambda, and the sign of the angle of the scattering. Light came in, and it got scattered off at some other angle. If you look at those two things together, this term becomes unimportant, very small, in two cases. One, if the wavelength is very big compared to A0. That's what we were talking about before. That's why I showed you the argon atom electron distribution. When lambda is very big compared to the, uh, the radius of the atom, which is holding most of the electrons, this term becomes small, and you get a simplified result. Another case when this, uh, when this becomes small is when the angle theta is very small. So the angle theta, if I go back, the angle theta is here. It's between the incident direction and the observation direction. So in forward scattering, this arrow is coming in this way, and this th uh, angle theta goes to 0. And, uh, and so sine theta becoming much, much, very much less than 1, make this phase term go away. That corresponds to forward scattering. So what this says is you get a simplified result, which doesn't depend on knowing where all the electrons are. You get, this term goes away, and you get the simplified result where I put in the superscript 0. I know it was a subscript on some of the slides, but th that su superscript means that you don't worry about the phase effect. And this, the formula now for the, the cross-section in those two cases will become, I guess I didn't write it here. Ah, the cross-section now for the atom with all of these electrons becomes the result that we had before for the free electron multiplied by this effect modulus squared. So it's, it's important in two cases. One is in the long wavelength limit, which is why I called the book soft x-rays instead of just x-rays. And the other is forward scattering. So we could actually use all our formulations about refractive index and everything if we just look in the forward direction. And, um, and now this, this uh, atomic scattering factor, as it's basically called, uh, is shown here. And it's complex. And so we break it up into a, a, a real and an imaginary component. Okay? And these will be related later when we get into refractive index to delta and beta. And I just note that some people, call, rather than break this up this way, they write it as z minus something. And the reason for that is, remember I showed you when we had some curves there for the atomic scattering factor. I said if you go to high enough photon energy, it becomes z, approximately. And uh, for instance, uh, if you're doing x-ray diffraction in crystals and you're operating at 20 kilovolts or so, you, your, your F1 basically comes to z. It depends on whether there's any more resonances yet. But anyway, that's why, uh, why this would be, in those, for really hard x-rays, this would be a more natural way to write it. And they, would, they tend to write it as F1 and F2, not, not so, so different. So, uh, so now I think we're, we're at the end here, I think. But at any rate, the cross-section, we did the free, the free electron, 
Then we did the bound electron, and now we've done a lot of bound electrons and an atom. And this is it. This is, this is the cross-section. You'll see that these same components are going to turn up in the refractive index when we do the next lecture. And um, uh, what else to tell you? Um, basically, you wind up, how do you, we had the question about how do you know F1 and F2. I'll, when we get to the next lecture, I'll explain that you, you basically measure F2 and you figure F1 using kromlitz kronig relations. Um, what, I'm forgetting to tell you something. So, so this is just leading into the, uh, 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 the correspondence with the, with the quantum mechanical result where now the summation here is over resonances, but actually you're going to do this. Uh, this is going to become oscillator strains because there are many different resonances that you can imagine. And with many electrons, you have to sum over all of that. So you have to sum over initial and final states for every single electron. And basically, you don't do it. You know what the mathematical form of the result is, but you use measured values uh, of F, F2 and infer F1. And so here's some of the res here's some of those what some of those results look like for F1 and F2 subscript or superscript zero here for carbon, and you see that if you get well enough above the resonance for carbon, this is the photon energy you'll level out to z equals 6 for carbon. And here's the absorptive part. And then if you do the same, uh, so this is, relates to what you would see with uh, mu, f2, they, look, they are related one to one. And, and I think, yeah. So here's the results for, uh, here, here for silicon, leveling off also at 14. And it should be the next one, molybdenum leveling off around 42, but there are all these resonances in there. So these are the atomic scattering factors, and basically we looked them up and we used them computationally, but now we sort of have a theoretical understanding of where it all comes from. I think that's the end. Well, this is just to remind you where we started from. So now we've done this part here, and we've gotten down, we've, we've done all of these things, and the next lecture we're going to go down this path, and we'll see that these same factors show up in the refractive index. And this I'll leave for another time. This is just a general uh, scattering formula for any scattering process. Conservation of energy and momentum lead you into these two relationships. And uh, if, you have a, if you were writing that you had a current density like this, and you said this has a Fourier components, and this has Fourier components like this, and like this, you wind up, you wind up naturally coming up with what would be, uh, you get a relationship in the exponents of frequencies and wave numbers. You put h bars on them, and you've got conservation of energy and momentum. And you can make a vector scattering diagram, which is isosceles in a special case where the frequency here is a relatively small. So for a crystal where nothing's moving, this is the incident frequency, the scattered frequency, the wavelength, they're the same. The wave numbers are changing. This is an isosceles triangle, and you get Bragg's law out of it. But it's much more general, and you use it, if, once you know it, you use it all the time. It appears everywhere. Okay, thank you for your patience. I'm sure that was quite difficult, but you now have, if you want to know more, you know where to go. <laughs> So I think we're ready. Oh, yes, please. Just a little question, maybe, uh, for people to explain why, uh, how people extract the density or temperature information from Thompson scattering and uh, related to this, what's the difference between Thompson scattering and Compton scattering? Oh, OK. Is so uh, if you had some plasma and you shine light into it, laser light, with some very well-defined wavelength coming in. Oh, sorry, Paul. It's fine. <laughs> and so this would be the forward. And the light, let's say, there's a bunch of, a lot of electrons in this plasma, some high density of electrons. OK, and they scatter light out all over the place, some back, some in the forward direction. And let's say you come out, it depends on the parameters, but let's just say you look at side scattering here. Um, if the particles were not moving at all, this frequ the frequency, the wavelength coming out would be the same as this, right? It would 
the, the, there's no change in frequency or wavelength here, and you would get something that looks as narrow as the laser line that produced it. Let's say there was a laser here. Okay, you shine it in, nobody's moving. You get a certain amount of scattering that depends on the cross section, right? So this cross section plays a role here, the Thompson for the free electron, tells you how much scattering you get along with the electron density. But suppose they're all moving. Some are moving away, some are moving towards you, right? Uh, they have a component of velocity this way, and you'll wind up getting a little spreading of the radiation. If it's a hot plasma, the velocities are larger, and this thing will spread out more. And so you can get some measure of this. This will give you a direct measurement with some assumed, let's say, Maxwell uh, velocity distribution, or whatever the real velocity distribution is, you will measure it here, and you can assign some temperature to it. Do, do a Gaussian fit to it or something like that, and this will give you a measure. The height will give you a measure of the electron density, because you know the cross-section, and the width will give you a measure of the electron temperature. Okay? And the hotter it is, the more it will spread. And that's if you look at a, a relatively large angle. If you look in the forward direction, you see some other interesting effects, but I think that answers your question. So that's that was the Thomson scattering. Compton scattering is what happens when the incident photon has uh, not only high energy, but as a result, um, there's some momentum associ associated with the photon, h bar k. So we knew it had a, a photon energy, h bar omega, but we were assuming that the h bar k was relative, that the momentum of a photon is small. It's massless, right? So in the scattering process, I said that if this light went in, you would have, without it, if there was no movement, you would have had something like that. But Compton noticed that, that actually there is a finite momentum, and then it's larger at higher photon energies, there's more momentum, and the scattering process will show up that change in momentum, and you'll see it. So it's a completely different thing. It's a single uh, electron effect, and uh, but it has to do with the momentum transfer. I can, may I add to it? Yeah, if you would. I wish someone would. It's is a clear effect where you see a, a, a quantum behavior of a, the field and the matter. A while uh, the scattering, uh, uh, Thompson scattering is essentially like the radio scattering is a coil. Where you get Coherent meaning the same wavelength. Yes, the same wavelength. Yeah. You get uh, scattered radiation with the same wavelength uh, of the instant radiation. In the case of Compton uh, scattering, you change. This is an increase. Because yeah. it's due to the short wavelength of the photon. Where in some way the particle like behavior of the photon is more. Yeah, great. Thank you. We can see the question maybe. And is the pointing vector uh, really dependent on time? Sure, it's instantaneous. Yeah, it changes. <coughs> uh, because, of, because of the radiative uh, energy by the moving the oscillating electron. Yes, I think so. But then in some of the equations, uh, like in. What is the instantaneous? acceleration of an electron. It depends on the instantaneous acceleration. So is there some point where the acceleration is zero in the oscillation? No? It's always, somebody help me here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks, yeah. So we are saying, so when the, oscill when the electron is oscillating, right, when it reaches the turnaround point to come back, the, that would be maximum yeah. Where am I? Somebody help me. <coughs> yeah, the velocity is zero there. And I guess uh, when you come through at the maximum velocity, I guess the acceleration is zero. So the acceleration is varying as a function of time. So the pointing vector. So we are taking the, the acceleration. I told the acceleration is uh, due to the external applied incident. Uh, yes, it is. But it's still oscillating. Yeah. Isn't it 
So it's like the swing. The child is on the swing. It's the same kind of thing. I'm assuming the play moves to be like constant in time. Uh, no. No, because the electric field is oscillating, the magnetic field is oscillating. So there's an instantaneous variation there. But I'm feeling on weak grounds at the moment, maybe because I've just been talking to you. So if someone else wants to add to that discussion, please say something. Uh, I think the key point is just using the Fourier transforms, you know, this, this, we use the class transforms all the time for continuous value differential equations. And the key point is always trying to move away from differential equations in time or space into algebraic equations just like you did. And then coming back at the end there's Fourier transforms. That's the that's the hard bit then. That's the hard bit you have to do after that. But it's a lot easier unless you do it numerically and solve them directly with equations in time. I think that's a key message from in this lecture is, you know, uh, is, is, is using the transforms. You know, use Fourier transform, use the mathematical methods to simplify the solution. And lots of people don't. They immediately decide to go to the computer and they try to numerically solve. I mean, you know, that's fine, but it doesn't translate. Yeah, you don't get the functional dependence. You, you don't get the physics. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's a good not question. Using uh, time-dependent Schrodinger equations for land crossing and everything. It's hard to get the physics. Anyway, you obviously asked a good question, because we, we hesitated on the answer. <laughs> or I did. Well, that, that equation is important in the case of these of strong fields, where you really are sensitive to the phase of the field. In terms of, I mean, you're dealing with very strong fields, and so this time averaged, steady state approach, you, you can't see anything. But it's relevant in the case of ultra strong fields. Yeah. That's the yeah. can, can you explain if you have a various uh, so, uh, binary, many electrons? Uh, uh, some electrons may be in one phase and another in opposite phase, and they oh. uh, can uh, sum destructively in the. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, oh, this morning's lecture, what was it when, when we showed the cross-section? Where was it? I don't remember where it was. This one. Oh, I see. It doesn't quite show it here, what I thought. But, uh, but basically, the angular distribution is not isotropic. There are peaks and valleys and different angles. And what's happening is constructive interference and destructive interference. And in some places, they're out of phase, and the, there's no there's less uh, radiation at that angle. So it all depends on what's the phase of these electrons or electron clouds, which are moving around dynamically, and they're interfering constructively and destructively at different angles. And so it's it's really a time dependent uh, mess for someone who's trying to calculate it. Yeah, but yes. So thank you. That was the. There used to be a diagram here that showed real <laughs> angular distributions. But yeah. Okay, so what we've been trying to do is basically use electromagnetic techniques for X-rays. Uh, if you're some of the fact things I mentioned about the, atom, uh, the atomic scattering fact is, if you look at R. W. James, a very famous book on X-ray diffraction, one of the really best classic books in X-rays. Uh, you'll find he, he writes he writes it in terms of z minus something because he's, he was a hard X-ray guy. And oh, maybe another, maybe one of the best pieces of information I give you since you're learning is there is a website. A, yeah, abe. Com. If you want to buy really good classical physics books, or actually child's books, or flowering books, or anything you want, you go to this ABE. Uh, we remember it in the US because of Abraham Lincoln, Abe. But it's Advanced Book Exchange. It's in Canada. And you can buy this. R.W. James would be a kind of book you could buy for $10. Sometimes you pay as much for the shipping as for the book. But you can get all of these terrific, uh, like Compton and Allison. Who I didn't, you probably never heard of Compton and Allison, but Compton from the Compton effect, and from this uh, whether you put uh, delta, 
refractive index was one minus delta plus or minus i beta. That early uh, X-ray book, uh, I, I was able to buy that book for about five dollars, a really high quality, because a lot of libraries are getting rid of their old books. They're not, no one's checking them out anymore, and they just put them on the market, and you can you can buy them, and they're very good atomic physics books or. Uh, they're not x-ray books, but they have a, they'll have a nice chapter like Leighton or uh, uh, some of the others. Anyway, if you go to this website, you can get uh, really great books. Which, you know, not everything in x-rays has changed that much. Uh, anyway, we should stop talking because we have a break and we said we were going to get Alan an early start and we're not. <laughs>